When looking at imagery of our universe and the web-like layout of galaxies to form superclusters and voids, the resemblance to neurons and brain cells is striking, though probably coincidental. But it does suggest a compelling idea. What if the fate of our universe is to be turned into one immense, godlike mind at the end of time? Today we'll be continuing our look at possible fates of the universe and civilizations at the end of time that we began way back in our episodes on black hole farming and iron stars, and most recently in our look at the Big Rip, where expansion of the universe occurs faster than we think, slowly tearing everything apart. In today's topic, we will see the reverse end time scenario, the Big Crunch, where the universe eventually stops expanding and begins contracting possibly eventually crunching back down to a singularity, a path toward what physicist Frank Tipler calls Omega Point Cosmology. In Frank Tipler's view, all the matter in the universe moves towards becoming part of life and intelligence, and ever more impressive states of it, and as the universe begins to contract, this contraction can fuel that life and intelligence. This intelligence can survive and indeed thrive eternally during this outcome, eventually reaching a point of godlike capabilities, what's known as the Omega Point. In addition, we'll cover everything from technological singularities to quantum consciousness and resurrection to other cyclic models for the universe and even God. So big topic, and one absolutely not likely to cause any disagreements and flame wars, I'm sure. We have a couple points we should start off by acknowledging though. First. While neither the Big Rip or Big Crunch can be ruled out entirely yet, neither is in favor with the scientific community at this time. The Big Crunch was one of the most popular scientific theories for how the universe would expire throughout the 1970s and 1980s, and it was our deepening knowledge of dark energy and an accelerating expansion of the universe in the later 90s and early 2000s that pushed it out of favor along with its close cousin, the Big Bounce which is where the universe expands, then contracts, then expands again in an endless cycle of big bangs. And indeed we have modern versions like Roger Penrose's Conformal Sacred Cosmology, which we will also cover briefly today. And again I say the Big Crunch is out of favor because our default assumption was that eventually gravity would kick in against any inertia causing expansion of space and the universe would slowly fall back in on itself, and this doesn't happen with dark energy. But since we have no idea where dark energy comes from, what it is, how it operates, if it operates at the same rate constantly, or if its supply is infinite, we're not exactly in a position of authority to say the big crunch is definitely out. It was the theory that I and most currently active physicists basically grew up on, and if you read sci-fi from that era, you'll encounter it almost constantly. The second thing is that while the Big Crunch is a scientific theory, like most scientific theories, especially those dealing with the fate of the universe, it generates a strong desire to put it into our worldview, and so you get lots of philosophical, theological, or ideological ponderings on it. These can range from deep and well thought out discussions to sophomoric ones of course. Sometimes these are resurgencies or adaptations of previously created concepts, and today's example, the Omega Point, is one of these cases. The Omega Point cosmology that followed later is just one example of the influence of that philosophy on science. The Omega Point is also considered a strong influence over the concept of a technological singularity, which is also tied up in Omega Point cosmology and as a result is very wrapped up in lots of early AI, transhumanist, and post-human concepts and philosophy. Indeed it is even keyed into the Gaia Hypothesis, the idea that our planet might itself qualify as alive in some fashion which we were discussing a few months back and which led to this topic being mentioned then requested by a lot of the audience and resoundingly winning our first ever image poll here on YouTube for selecting an episode topic. What that means though is that since the Omega Point has its origins as a theological concept influenced by science, it has a lot of folks who support or attack it mostly on that basis and it is viewed negatively by many thinkers as being rather mystic and religious, while also being viewed by many theologians as not just wrong, but more than a bit heretical, as it not only involves Darwinian evolution, but extends that to the assumption that all inanimate matter evolves towards becoming alive, then intelligent, until all matter evolves or is incorporated into either God 
or some part of God or infinite parallel to that. This makes it a touchy topic and one not particularly loved by cosmologists or western theologians, though also very popular with both. Nonetheless, to cover the topic properly we will need to enter that realm and that's probably why we've never done an episode on this topic before. At the same time, the concept has had such a huge impact on science, science fiction, theology, philosophy, and culture that it definitely is worth knowing about. So we will try to treat it with respect in that regard while still focusing principally on its scientific points and the pros and cons of those. That's a discussion that's going to be detailed and require some thinking, so you might want to grab a drink and a snack for some brain food. We don't want to dwell on the theological speculation too much, but we need to set out some of the history behind these ideas. By the early 20th century science was really converging on the notion that the universe was vast and old, even older than our world, which itself was far older than we had assumed. This was not even really a religious doctrine at the time, it was simply what so many assumed, that mankind had been around a real long time, potentially on the order of thousands of years. It's not that we didn't think the Universe and Earth were ancient and immense, it's just that a lot of zeros were missing compared to our current figure for their ages. And it makes sense in an era where, borrowing some basic work in archaeology, we knew history had started sometime before ancient Greece and the writings of Herodotus, but there was no reason to think that it had started much longer ago than that. Scaling up the age and size of the cosmos to include billions and billions of stars, many older than our own and likely many with planets like our own, really changed our worldview, and we see contemplations like the Omega Point on one hand and others like H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulian cosmic horror genre. It also attracted a lot of theologians to study the sciences and try to match them up to doctrine in some fashion, and did one of the largest pools of early scientists were clergy of one religion or another. So what was the Omega Point concept? Teilhard de Chardin originated the idea sometime in the earlier half of the 20th century, along with the notion of the Neurosphere, which we'll get to in a second. His writings in The Phenomenon of Man wouldn't be published till after his death in 1955. Teilhard de Chardin was a paleontologist and Jesuit priest, as well as a highly decorated veteran of the First World War, and his work had a huge influence on the Jesuit order, not to mention a lot of scientists and thinkers of that era, and indeed to this day. Teilhard's Omega Point is more focused on Darwinian evolution than on cosmology. The cosmology aspect of the Omega Point came after his death, as did the notion of a technological singularity, as computers were still very new. It focused on the notion that evolution was not centered on humanity, that it had begun long before us and would keep on going too. His philosophy was that this evolutionary process begins with inanimate matter becoming alive in that first amoeba and proceeds to an eventual future state of divine consciousness. Our current step, as humanity entered the biosphere, created the newer sphere, the cognitive layer of existence. As time and evolution proceed, this newer sphere will gain coherence and move to a final point in which all matter and energy will have reached that divine consciousness, what was dubbed the Omega Point in reference to God as the Alpha and Omega at the beginning and end of time. If that's sounding a bit familiar to you, us evolving into a higher godlike state, it is probably because it was so influential on so much science fiction and New Age thinking of the 60s and 70s. Since his works were very frowned on by the Roman Catholic Church of the time, I dare say it added a bit of rebellious flavor to the topic. That's a bit before my time, though it definitely influenced my parents' generation and my parents personally, I had a very interesting theological upbringing with one Catholic and one Jewish parent who both met while studying science in California in the 1970s. Yes, both my parents were hippies, and this was one of the many varied spiritual concepts I got exposed to a lot as a kid and have a nostalgic fondness for. Omega Point cosmology gets a lot of criticism, much of it justified, though some unfairly harsh and prone to both ad hominem and argument by ridicule, which I always dislike. One of those is that while Teilhard is considered a bored thinker, he takes a lot of liberty with scientific terms and energy is a critical one in there. He defines both tangential energy, which is the normal kind in physics, and radial energy, which is psychic or spiritual energy that accumulates over time to reach that omega point, 
and maybe best translates as information, or souls or both. That would be fine if he didn't tend to use them interchangeably. We do this a little bit too with different types of energy except for us, information wouldn't be measured in units of physical energy like heat or mass or kinetic energy all, and can't just be substituted in and out. This sort of flawed equivalence in pondering philosophical concepts, along with having some interesting concepts hinging on tricky cases in math and logic involving zero, one, and infinity, often result in conceptual problems. We discuss these kinds of problems more in our episode, Things Which Will Never Exist. Anyway, the Omega Point Theory has four formal properties. First, that humans will escape the heat death of the Universe. Tehard's version is that radial energy, being psychic or spiritual, is not subject to entropy like normal or tangential energy, which we argue inevitably transmutes into heat energy as opposed to mass or other types. For context, this would be saying your soul is essentially indestructible, and the energy associated with it is thus unable to be run down by entropy into some lesser form of energy like heat. In Tiplo's later, arguably more scientific version, this is because of the Big Crunch. There is also an alternative approach in something along the lines of Freeman Dyson's Eternal Intelligence concept, which we will also discuss in a bit. Second, the Omega Point has the property that it does not exist within the timeline of our Universe, but rather is at the edge of time or end of time. This notion can be seen as important because if your goal is something infinite, the finite progression of time is a pain. For example, in the case of a technological singularity, we usually talk of a computer able to begin as just a bit smarter than a human, then able to make a computer just a little bit smarter than it was, or an upgrade to itself, which then does likewise. This eventually snowballs into a bean that grows ever smarter until it is godlike. However, since that often means infinite, no matter how many times you double the intelligence of a critter, it is still a finite number, not infinite, unless you have an infinite amount of time to do it in. There is a special case though if the steps to each doubling take less time, each progressive doubling, akin to Zeno's paradox. This one can often get you what I sometimes refer to as a retro-causal god, one that descends from mankind or mankind's artifice to become godlike at a later date and then goes back in time to create the Universe. A Big Bounce version of this is seen in Isaac Asimov's classic short story, The Last Question, where humans begin creating ever better computers as they journey out into the galaxy and keep asking it how to stop entropy or reverse the second law of thermodynamics, and the computer keeps replying, there is as yet insufficient data for a meaningful answer. And appropriately, its response is always in all capital letters, as at the end of time, long after humanity has died off or merged with it to escape the heat death of the Universe, it finds itself contemplating the question in the absolute darkness left after, and at the end of the story speaks the words, let there be light, and there was light. It's a beautiful story and often considered Asmo's best short, also our first SFIA Audiobook of the Month and was first adapted to audio for Planetarium Show by Leonard Nimoy way back in 1966, when he was first playing the role of Spock on Star Trek. An issue with a big bounce deity of that type in Asmo's story is wondering what happened to it going forward or to its presumed predecessor who would have set off the events in the last iteration of the Universe. Anyway, these difficulties with infinity and finite numbers takes us to our third property, which is the Omega Point can be thought of as being cone-shaped, where a slice of it from the base to tip has a certain finite area, but the final tip is zero, and that's the same infinity issue we just discussed only backward, whereas I can double something over and over and never reach infinity, I can cut it in half over and over, shrink it more and more, and never reach zero either and this has been a philosophical conundrum since at least the time of the philosopher Zeno of Elia in the 5th century BC, which is the notion that if you take a step toward a wall that covers half the distance to it, then another step to cover half the remainder, then another covering half the now smaller remainder, and so on, that you never reach that wall. Nonetheless, a cone is a real object with a point-like tip, kind of, and is an example of a singularity, they are at the tip, 
which is what he is using as the reason for finite stuff going to zero or infinity, and he could say if the Big Bang began with an infinitely small point, stepping back in time by going to each point at which it was half its size would never get you to zero but it clearly must have started that way. Though as we've discussed in other episodes, we do not know that the Big Bang was point-like and that is a topic of great debate in cosmology. However, I said that Cone's tip was point-like, kind of, because as best as we can tell, nothing in nature is infinitely divisible. You get a smallest indivisible bit, which cannot be cut further down, which is where we get the word atom from in Greek, even if it turned out that title was given at least a couple steps prematurely above nuclei and quarks and maybe strings too. Whatever cones end with in math, in nature they have a finitely wide atom at their tip, and we do not know the Big Bang had an infinitely tiny origin point or that black holes condense into them either, but that's been the common belief so that's addressed in properties 3 and 4 with the cone example. And 4 follows on by saying that this cone shaped volume of the Omega Point is a finite thing. It is reminiscent of Thomas Aquinas' speculation about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, only all pin is a cone, and the question might be about how many angels you need to merge together to form a god. And perhaps how you can turn men into angels. Critically, it is the idea that we are on a path to evolving into something higher, and from there it goes to the notion that Earth and humanity must eventually be compressed into an infinitely small dot, and I gather Tehar de Chardin was not expecting humanity to engage in space travel beyond our world or considered it irrelevant. The final dot is the Omega Point God, something infinite or infinitesimal, attached to something else manifestly finite. To move on to Frank Tipler's Omega Point cosmology, this extrapolates out to the whole universe. As Tipler is a mathematical physicist and cosmologist, his reasoning in those regards is much more solidly explained than Tehard's, though we'll still be skimming over that and hopefully I summarize it correctly enough. Tipler is still alive and kicking as the time I'm writing this, so can always correct me if he feels I've explained it wrong but I believe the notion was first publicly introduced in his 1984 book The Anthropic Cosmological Principle, which may be stated as, intelligent information processing must come into existence in the universe, and, once it comes into existence, will never die out. This parallels Tehard's notion of radial energy not being subject to entropy, of being a pathway to true immortality. Here though, we will introduce two similar notions, Tipler's own cosmological Omega Point and Freeman Dyson's eternal intelligence. The Omega Point relies on the Big Crunch scenario and the eternal intelligence on the heat death of eternal expansion rather than gravity dragging everything back together. By the way, that 1984 book co-written with John Barrow is where we get the halt tipler conjecture of the Fermi Paradox that we discuss so often on this channel. It also has a discussion of using von Neumann probes, and what it tells us about the Universe was highly influential on myself and a lot of other futurists, including Andor Sandborg. We will be borrowing Sandborg's criticism of Omega Point later, but I share with him a great deal of respect for Tipler overall and for me the halt tipler conjecture was the stepping stone for the Dyson Dilemma concept I presented in the first episode of the show's fourth season back in January of 2015. Now Freeman Dyson, who is one of the most beloved thinkers and inspirations of the show, had proposed the eternal intelligence concept in 1979 in his excellent paper Time Without End inside the framework of the heat death of the universe by proposing that since the amount of energy needed to perform a single computation, or thought, is inversely related to the temperature, that if a civilization had a finite amount of energy stored on hand, as the stars all died out, they could expend some of it, say half, to run their computers or brains at the current temperature. In Dyson's scenario, as the Universe expanded and cooled more to say half that prior temperature, they could expend half of the remainder, and since it's half the temperature, they get twice the computation, per energy used, so the same as they got the first time. Now they only have a quarter of their stored energy left and have had two equal-sized periods of thought, one fueled by the first half of their energy reserve 
and the second by expending a quarter of that original. Now the invoices cool again to half the temperature, and they expend another eighth of their reserve and get another third but equal amount of thought. As with Zeno's paradox, they never run out of energy but they keep on thinking. Each period they must go slower from an external perspective, as they slowly use their power to think, but they never run out. The subjective time is stretched over even longer eons as the universe cools ever more and they use their stockpiles ever slower, but they have an infinity, or near infinity at least, of thought and experience, and the outside is a dead and boring place anyway, so it hardly matters to them that the clock runs faster outside. Those who remember our discussions in Black Hole Farming and Ion Stars will remember this concept, but there we delved into more practical limitations of storage and decay, whereas Dyson focused on it mostly as a basic theoretical concept and a fun thought experiment. Tiplo's approach is essentially reversing for the Big Crunch scenario, as the Universe begins to contract rather than expand, from gravity finally slowing that expansion then reversing it, the Universe instead begins to warm up. Here he assumes, as we often do on this channel, that in the deep future every bit of the Universe we, or some other alien civilization, can reach will be turned into some artifice serving humanity or those aliens, probably giant computers on which post-biological life has uploaded itself. All the Universe has been transformed into either power plants, computers, or reserves awaiting use to fuel and repair those, and we or our descendants are uploaded onto this mega computer, the notion there being that we all merge into one enormous mega mind, something dwarfing even a Machioska brain. Now as the Universe contracts and the temperature rises, this contraction can power this mega mind, Indeed we tend to assume there are many mega minds at this point, who will begin merging as the Universe contracts. As the contraction continues, the time it takes to send signals between various nodes of the ever more unified mind decrease, and the energy available for thinking rises, in the opposite fashion to the Dyson scenario. Tiplo's one has subjective thinking speed rising ever faster relative to the surrounding Universe, as it grows smaller and hotter in reverse of the time after the Big Bang. As the end approaches, that final moment, subjectively, becomes infinitely long, or close to it, with all those remaining minds or megacomputers crammed into one and thinking with virtually no signal lag or power limitations. We've drawn this example in the case of evaporating black hole civilizations living around black holes as they grow brighter and brighter before flaring out or living as a Machioska brain around a star-going supernova, or in the case of the Big Rip, if you could tap dark energy for power near the end, which is easier there. When we've discussed it though, we've usually meant it as a very powerful last burst of consciousness, not an eternal one, though I won't deny I've often used poetic phrasing like a last frozen moment of eternity to describe it, and in context it might be some single second that subjectively felt like trillions of years. An outsider sees an explosion lasting a heartbeat, but those inside experienced eons. Whole civilizations rose and fell and rose again in that single moment. Anyway, the big crunch version of this is Tiplo's Omega Point Cosmology, and it goes a step further by saying this is truly infinite and is also the literal resurrection scenario for humanity discussed in Christian eschatology, as you'd have the ability to simulate or emulate anyone who had ever lived before and eternally from their perspective. This is where a lot of the popularity and also objections start coming from. There's a great science fiction trilogy by Frederick Pohl, the Eschaton Trilogy, that actually handles humanity encountering two powerful and ancient alien empires who fight to control that eventual Eschaton, and unfortunately the last book came out about the same time the Big Crunch Theory was losing its foothold as a major contender for the fate of the Universe. Alright, so what are the major problems here? Well, the big one nowadays, of course, is that the Big Crunch is not a major contender anymore. We should note that this has no bearing on Tejal de Chardin's original premise or how it influenced concepts like technological singularities. 
As I mentioned earlier, we have not actually disproved that the Universe might collapse on itself one day, though I think the argument for that option is not strong at this time. Also, there's other ways the Universe might collapse on itself, like vacuum collapse, and for that matter there are crunch-like or cyclical options in concepts like string theory, M-theory, and brain cosmology, to which I've heard folks adapt a mega point to with varying degrees of skill or rigor. Tiplo obviously gets a lot of flack for basically interpreting this as proof of not only some eventual neo-god forming, which is certainly normal enough in futurism and transhumanism concepts, but a very real and infinite and specifically Christian one, and we are essentially bypassing that part of it, as this show is not about attacking or defending any given theology, and this is where most of the criticisms lay or are rooted out of, and you can go read his reasoning and criticisms and rebuttals of those and the rebuttals of the rebuttals of it elsewhere. If you do, I'd recommend Tipler's books themselves and some online essays by him, and for criticisms, and or Sandborg, as he treats the topic respectfully and in detail. You can also see some of the arguments for and against it, or modifying it, from David Deutsch, who is best known for his contributions to quantum computing. For the science of it, Tiplo makes five basic claims for his argument, which I'll just quote from his webpage. 1. The Universe is spatially closed has finite spatial size and has the topology of a three-sphere. 2. There are no event horizons, implying the future sea boundary is a point, the Omega Point. 3. Life must eventually engulf the entire Universe and control it. 4. The amount of information processed between now and the final state is infinite. 5. The amount of information stored in the Universe diverges to infinity as the final state is approached. Which, to summarize and simplify, if the amount of information you can process and store between now and the end of the Universe is infinite, then every bit of information, including a recording of your brain, is in play. Tiplo has updated the theory and argument to account for more modern cosmology, including a quantum omega point, and also in the context of the many worlds interpretation of quantum. We'll discuss some of those notions in our upcoming Multiverse Warfare episode coming out next month, right before Marvel releases Quantum Mania and we get to see Kang the Conqueror join the MCU. One of those flaws or issues with it though is black holes themselves, as they do have event horizons and we've observed them at this point, and they would seem to very much interfere with the option for infinite growth of information. Though again we have no idea if information is preserved inside black holes or not, and that was the source of a long and legendary debate between Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose, who shared the Wolf Prize for their work together developing singularity theorems and black holes. Penrose, who finally got a much deserved and delayed Nobel Prize in Physics in 2020, is himself no stranger to bold and contested ideas. Many know him from his hypothesis of orchestrated objective reduction, also called Orc OR, which argues that consciousness could originate at the quantum level inside neurons, which has lots of supporters and detractors and might make for a fun topic to cover all on its own sometime. But he also offers another big crunch parallel cosmology, conformal cyclic cosmology, which he detailed in his 2010 book, Cycles of Time and which also might make for a great episode on its own, but it draws its notion from the possibility that we might see the ghosts of long dead black holes in the cosmic microwave background radiation that evaporated by Hawking radiation. It is believed that black holes slowly give off power as photons of light as they age and shrink in mass, and give off ever more and more quickly till glowing briefly for a moment like a star, before finally evaporating completely. The reasoning here, and its relevance to Big Crunch and Omega Point, is that time moves slower the faster you go as you approach light speed, but at the speed of light itself, no time passes. For photons, particles of light, they experience no time themselves and most, once emitted, will never be reabsorbed and grow less likely to as the Universe expands and ages, and thins out and if all matter including black holes eventually disappears as it turns into photons, then eventually all the mass or energy left in the Universe is photons which experience no time in their frame of reference. 
and that means every frame of reference left behind has no time passing, which means that any given point might have several photons pass through it over a given time, as they journey around, but to them they all went through that point in the same moment, and each photon will cover an infinite distance in its journey that to it takes no time at all. You can argue this means that, once all those reference frames experiencing time disappear, at the end of time rather literally, then the Universe is actually infinitely dense, as there is no longer any meaningful way to measure distance or time, and this is essentially a big crunch condition. All the energy in the Universe is now in a spot with no distance or time again, just like at the hypothetical Big Bang. This is not a total reset incidentally, as it posits we should be able to see the signature of the gravitational waves caused by collisions of black holes in prior iterations of the Universe, called aeons in the theory. Black hole collisions or mortals are enormous events that dwarf supernovae in their power release, and as you may recall we first witnessed one only a few years back. I'm not sure if conformal cyclic cosmology operates if proton decay is not a thing, but it is a fascinating option, and I think you could make the case that the Omega Point reasoning could switch over here, though possibly more the Dyson scenario we normally contemplate for the heat death, eternal intelligence. Of course the notion that the Universe might eventually be turned into one gigantic brain, albeit a finite one in size and duration, does work under any of the known models for the fate of the Universe, it is the infinite size or duration that's problematic and we've discussed mind-bendingly huge but finite versions many times on the show. If you've seen images of the Lenakia supercluster of galaxies we live in being compared in shape and appearance to brain cells, it is not terribly hard to picture our universe as one enormous mind already. So there's the Omega Point in a nutshell. There's a lot more reasoning of course and more rebuttals and variations, but that's a good place to start if you'd like to learn more. For my part, as I've mentioned, I've always found it fascinating as a concept, and I imagine after today you can see why, as it opens the door to so many interesting ideas and discussions, which I'd encourage everyone to have in our comments section below, though as always with courtesy, as the topic does tend to ignite some fiery discussions, but it's winter when this episode comes out so it might help keep you warm. To paraphrase my favorite poet Robert Frost poem Fire and Ice, Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, Omega Point Cosmology is for those who favor fire, and eternal intelligence will suffice for those who favor ice. Incidentally, if you're looking for more on major current theories of beginnings and ends, there's an excellent look at the topic by Professor Jim Kalili over on CuriosityStream, The Beginning and End of the Universe. Since writing this episode though I decided that I want to spend a little bit more time discussing Roger Penrose's conformal cyclic cosmology than we got to today, and so we'll be doing a short bonus episode over on Nebula on that topic. We often do extended editions of the episodes over on Nebula, but by popular request, especially when it's a standalone topic, we'll be doing them as separate shorts going forward rather than adding to the episode and you can find all of SFA's content over on Nebula a few days early and ad-free. Again, no commercials or sponsor messages, and that includes both our audio-only versions and our new 4K Ultra HD episodes. Nebula is the largest creator-owned streaming service out there and I am very proud to be one of its co-founders, as it's allowed so many creators to have an additional platform they can work on, safe from YouTube's mercurial algorithms, and seemingly ever longer and more intrusive ads, so it lets us offer options like our extended editions and bonus content like we'll be having today, and some Nebula exclusives like Planets vs Megastructures and the Coexistence with Aliens series. Now you can subscribe to Nebula all by itself, but we have also partnered up with CuriosityStream, the home of thousands of great educational videos like the beginning and end of the universe. That lets us offer Nebula for free as a bonus if you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in our episode's description. Again you can get CuriosityStream and Nebula for less than $15 a year, just use the link in the episode's description. So today we are seeing ways civilizations might endure even the death of stars and the end of time, and next week we'll look at an option for reaching those stars as we consider the possibility of using asteroids as spaceships, both interplanetary and interstellar. 
and the week after that we'll consider how to terraform new worlds once we arrive at them. Before that though, next Sunday, January 29th, we'll have our monthly live stream Q&A at 4pm Eastern Time where you can submit questions in our chat and have them answered live. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also carry on the discussion by leaving comments on the episode or visiting one of our social media forums, like those on Facebook, Reddit, and Discord, where thousands of members join discussions of science and futurism. And links for all of those are available in the episode's description. As always, thanks for watching and have a great week.